Hi, I'm Pete and welcome to Just a Few Acres Farm. Today is day one, episode one of me going through this Super C. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna assess the health of the engine and then we're gonna go from there. I'm gonna start with the teardown and then at the end of the video, I'm gonna talk about what my plans are as far as bringing this thing back to like new condition because it doesn't run too bad now, but we need to verify some things first. I drained the oil and the coolant and the gasoline. I also uh, degreased and pressure washed this tractor outside, which will make my cleanup work a little bit easier. She was pretty clean to begin with because I've washed it before, but we touched her up a little bit. First thing we gotta do is remove this cowl or radiator grill, whatever you wanna call it. She's pretty bent up. I'm going to have to do some straightening work on this. And next, unfortunately, I'm going to have to remove this alternator that I just put on. That's the way it goes. Take the radiator brace off. Disconnect the top radiator hose and get it freed up. Loosen up the lower radiator hose and get it freed up. Take out the bottom radiator mounting bolts here to free up the radiator. Well, come on, you. A lot easier to get at than on an H or an M, that's for sure. All right, let's see if we can get this loosened up and off. There we go. This radiator is toast. It's been patched a bunch of times, and it does what I, it weeps. That's what I call it. I have to put some coolant in it a couple times a year. It weeps around this connection. In the old days, you could bring it to a radiator shop. Those things are mostly a thing of the past, and I feel more comfortable with a quality new radiator. I get my new radiators from Northern Radiator. Next, to pull this top radiator hose off. This is a thermostat housing. There's the thermostat. Let me get the snap ring out of here. There we go. That's the thermostat. I've replaced that in the past. Now we can loosen up this fan on its adjustment bolt and take it off. Well, I can see a lot better than the last time I was at these belts, that's for sure. Then take off the sender that goes to the temperature gauge here. I've replaced this too. Replaced a lot on this tractor over the years. There we go. Then we can take this fan mount and thermostat housing off. We're headed toward taking the head off here. That's the first major engine component we want to get apart. You're tight. We'll put the half inch ratchet on you. You're rusted right in there, aren't you? Don't break. Just in review, since I'm starting a new series here, I like using hand tools most of the time. Ratchets and wrenches instead of power tools. It's just more relaxing for me. This is what I do for fun, as well as to benefit the farm. Well, you were, at least you didn't break. Okay. Now we can see what's going on in here. So the fan and the, the upper radiator connection was here. The water pump is actually down here, and I suspect that's and it's not up here because that was a later add-on. This engine was first designed without a water pump on it. It was just thermosiphon. So that's the water pump pulley. This is the crank pulley, and then this is the governor here, and this connection going through here is how the governor controls the carburetor fuel supply. So the next thing we're going to do here is we're going to take off the air cleaner, the carburetor, and the manifold. And I'm going to go ahead and first take off the fuel line to get that out of the way up at the sediment bowl. Why won't you come off? You were telling me just yesterday you wanted to come off. Did you change your mind? There we go. Get that out. Now we got to reach back here and disconnect the choke rod on the carburetor. These are always fun to get to. Gotta get the little cotter pin out. There we go. Can disconnect this air cleaner where it connects to the carburetor here.
Then we can take the carburetor off. I find it's easier to take the bolts off the top of the carburetor and then disconnect this governor linkage that's on the back side after we get the carburetor loose. And this carburetor is definitely going to need a rebuild. I have not rebuilt it since I owned the tractor. This brazing you see here is a vacuum port that got sealed up at one time or another. You see that quite often on these. And now we can get at the governor linkage a little more easily. We've got to pull the cotter pin out of here. There we go. One Zenith carburetor. Take the intake and exhaust manifold off. They're one piece. Hopefully none of the bolts will snap. This is a 1953 Super C and the engine is 123 cubic inches. It's a C carbureted, 123. And this model succeeded the regular C tractor and the differences between a regular C and a Super C are the increased engine displacement, 10 cubic inches. The regular C was 113 cubic inches. Pretty much the same engine with a smaller bore, and it's the same engine that started out in the Farmall A. And I've worked on a bunch of this family of engines, pretty familiar with them. Other differences between the C and the Super C, the Super C has a water pump, the regular C did not. They made the radiator a little taller. I think it was to do, to do with maybe greater compression and um, more cubic inches in the engine. The regular C had live hydraulics on it like this does uh, with rock shaft arms and then it's got a two-point hitch in the back, a Farmall fast hitch. And the other difference is that the Farmall C had band brakes and this has got disc brakes on it. And there were a whole bunch, if you, if you look in some of the literature, there's a, a lot of other smaller differences, but those are the main ones. None of these studs broke off. That's very good. those little teeny ports. <laughs> Just in review, one of the ways I keep track of what goes where is I use Ziploc bags and I label them. These are the manifold nuts here and then I put them in a cardboard box and I know what hardware goes to what. That finishes that side of the engine all cleaned off. On this side we just got to take the plugs out. <laughs> Come off you. Hmm. Here are the plugs in order. We got a decent burn on one and two. I like to run these tractors a touch rich. Better a touch rich than lean. These look all right to me. Sooty, a little bit. But three and four, this engine burns some oil. You know, it's smoked mainly on startup, but it really smoked. You could always see smoke coming through the exhaust pipe. And, uh, you can see where we're getting some oil blow by on these. Now we're getting into the engine. Pull the valve cover off. See what's inside. Here's what we got. Rocker arms, push rods, valve springs. I don't see anything disastrous here. This milky oil is caused by us running the tractor for short periods a lot of time. It doesn't warm up enough to boil the water off condensation inside the block. Hmm. She's crusty. Next job is to pull this rocker arm assembly. So much simpler than the MD was. These are nice little engines to work on. Push rods can come out. Don't need to keep track of where they go because we adjust the valve lash when we put the engine back together. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull these studs off now. They gotta come off sooner or later. It's easier when the head's still on. Alrighty, here we go. We're gonna loosen up the head nuts in reverse order of the way we would torque them down putting it on. Just loosen them up a tad to begin with. I have all of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine head nuts on this. Easy peasy. 
I put the hoist on, it's a good way to pop the head loose, even though this head's fairly light. Put some tension on it. Give her a few whacks. He's coming. There we go. Ow. Well, what do we see in here? Nothing surprising at first glance. Carbon on the pistons. I don't see any obvious leaks in the head gasket, which I didn't think there were any. I guess it looks like what I would expect. Let's see how much of a ridge we got on the, on the sleeve here. Not much of a ridge at all, which the ridge indicates how worn things are, how long it's been running with that piston sleeve. I can barely feel it with my fingernail. I'll get you. See, really no ridge at all. That is a good sign. Since the engine doesn't have that much wear on it. And here is the bottom of the cylinder head. Again, you know, carbon. <laughs> That's what you get with these old tractor engines, especially when they don't run for extended periods of time and warm up and blow this out. Yeah. No obvious blows in the head gasket, no obvious cracks in the head, although you can't tell for sure until you clean it up. You can pull this old head gasket off and have a look at it next and the underside of it here. Nothing earth shattering here either. This is the uh, block side of the head gasket. Of course, this is an old metal sandwich head gasket. I like these head gaskets with copper ceiling rings on it. I don't see any evidence again of any blown head gasket here, so we're good. That's the top side. And then here on the top of the block, you know, we just want to look for anything unusual. Cracks, although I don't expect to see any. Just carbony, that's all. Needs good cleaning. And I know this is going to sound goofy to the perfectionists out there, but one way you can check if the pistons are worn, you know, if the skirts have become worn, is just the wiggle test. The piston wiggles it all in the bore, and these don't. I'm hoping I can reuse these. Next, I'm going to open up the bottom end of the engine by taking the oil pan off, and that way we can take a look at the bearing clearances and pull the pistons. Okay, got all the bolts off. Let's get this off. First of all, take a look inside this oil pan. You want to feel for gritty pieces, like pieces of metal. And if you see a lot of gray stuff, that's bearing material. This has got nothing in it. This is that milky oil again from running it cool. Just a little bit of sludge in the bottom. I've had this pan off, well, I guess it's been 15 years, but there's nothing in here alarming. No parts of pistons or rings or anything like that. Now we can scooch up under here and get dripped on by the oil pickup. And take a look at what we've got. A few notable things about this family of engines. These are wet sleeved engines, which means that the cylinder sleeves are directly in the cooling jacket and they have O-rings at the bottom that seal them to the block. And sometimes those O-rings can leak and you'll see drips of antifreeze where they are leaking so you want to look for that and I don't see anything and there was no evidence that it was leaking antifreeze into the block before the other notable thing is these oil pumps right here these are notorious for blowing a seal in other words this cover is thin enough where it warps enough where oil will blow out the side of it. And then that'll read like you've got a tired engine. It'll read low oil pressure when it gets warm. The solution for that, and I've done that with this one already, is to take this bottom cover off and get a piece of float glass with sandpaper on it and sand the bottom, the top side of this cover flat again to take the warp out of it. 
And then you, of course, got to get the right gasket thickness. I think I used a piece of cereal box in here to get the right gasket thickness to get the oil pump to seal properly. And now the oil pressure on this engine is just fine, which is one indicator that these bearings are doing all right. When I first got this tractor, I pulled the pan off and fixed the oil pump. And I also replaced the main bearings and the rod bearings on the crankshaft. They had standard main and rod bearings and the date on them I think was in the 60s if I remember right and they were worn so I put in same size standard bearings and I've never had a problem with the holding oil pressure it acts like it has fairly tight bearings the oil pressure kind of slowly goes down when you're done operating the tractor um, but I think what I'm going to do is pull at least one main bearing cap and measure the clearance and look at the crankshaft journal and do the same for a rod bearing. Actually, I'm going to pull out all four pistons because I want to clean them up and it just makes sense to at least, at the very least, re-ring them while I'm into the engine. Cheap and it's good insurance and that's what I'm going to do after the oil clip's dripping on me. Before I do that though, I'm going to pull out this oil pump so it's not in the way and so that it doesn't annoy me anymore by dripping on me all the time. There's your oil pump driven off the camshaft. There's that plate that I was talking about that needs to be sanded flat. What a mess. It's the next day. I had to quit early yesterday to make a pork butt and sweet corn for Sunday dinner. And of course I gotta work around feeding the animals and all that, so it's not like I can work all day long. But the first thing we're going to do here is pull out or pull off one of the rod bearing caps and measure the clearance to see if we're within spec or not. Well, let's just do number two. In order to measure running clearance on these bearings, I put a piece of red plastic gauge in this rod bearing cap and red plastic gauge is meant to measure two to six thousandths clearance based on how much it crushes. Running clearance on these spec is one thousandths to three and a half thousandths. I doubt they'll be one thousandths, so the 02 to 06, two to six thousandths should work fine. We'll torque it back in. Two mark, number two piston goes toward the crankshaft. Put this cap back on and torque it to 45 foot pounds. And then reverse it, take it back off, see how much crush that we got. The plastic gauge stuck to the crankshaft journal, which isn't uncommon. You just read the little scale here. And it looks like we're running, that's 03 on that end. And that's 04 plus a little bit on that end. That's three thousandths to four thousandths. And the crankshaft journal looks pretty good. Nothing I can catch with my finger in there. So now we can go ahead and pull the piston. And I want to push this up. Be careful not to hit the journal. I think I can just take this block of wood and put it on the end of the stud on the connecting rod and push the piston out. There we go. And here's our piston. Number two, piston. Now comes the difficult part, and it's really not a linear process for me evaluating what to do with this engine. I look at a whole bunch of different things and think about it. There's more play on the piston pins than I would like to see. That's factor one, I guess you can call it. It's not terrible, but I'm used to these being fairly tight. There's a spec for that. and then. When I look at the piston, I've got some wear where you would expect to see wear. This is the way that the piston goes, is free to travel side to side as it goes up and down in the bore. The rings, well, the only way I have of evaluating the rings is by taking the ring and putting it back in the bore, getting it square with the piston top, and then putting a 20 thousandths feeler gauge in the end gap of the rings. Maximum ring end gap is 20 thousandths, and that's loose in there. See how loose that is? And that's a decent way to evaluate both sleeve and 
ring wear because as the ring wears that gap at the ends of the ring is going to increase. And then as far as looking at the sleeve goes evaluation you know there's the ridge which after further investigation you can feel on some parts of the sleeve but not on others. So there is some wear in the sleeve. The sleeve is obviously it's gone smooth from where it's not got that hatch pattern on it anymore. So at this point I'm thinking I've got two options. Number one is kind of what I expected to do in the beginning which is reuse the pistons. I'd have to hone the cylinders um, to put the hatch back on them, cover the crankshaft to protect it while I'm honing with the crankshaft in, put a new set of rings in on the existing pistons, reuse the piston pins, piston pin bushings, and have the head redone. That's option one. Option two is to do a complete rebuild and it's not something I expected to get into with this engine because it runs pretty good except for smoking a little bit and when it gets hot it acts it loosens up a little bit mostly in the valve train but for me what really told the story is this see this ridge this is the main bearing or the main bearing journal on the crankshaft this is the oil groove that goes around the bearing this ridge is probably just from feel one to two thousandths tall on the center here now when I replaced the bearing shells when I first got this tractor they had been replaced before so this engine's gone twice just having new bearings put in without polishing or grinding the crankshaft that oil groove buildup is what the crankshaft should be so that's how much wear I have on the crankshaft at least one or two thousandths and it's uneven wear. When I put plastic gauge on the main bearing, the clearance was five to six thousandths. Spec is maximum of three and a half thousandths. I have uneven wear on the bearings here. This is the main bearing that came off that crankshaft journal that I just showed you. See how it's worn on this side and worn on this side. Things are rattling around in there a little bit. I think the tolerances are a lot looser than they should be. So as I said, this is all a judgment call. You could go either way. I mean, I could have left this engine together and it ran fine and it would have run fine for years for the use that we're given this tractor. So here's what I'm thinking. I'm gonna go through this tractor, probably not to the extent that I did the MD because I've already done some things to it. And I wanna make sure this tractor runs well for the rest of my life. And I'm all right, if I'm gonna put paint on this and make it look like new, Getting into the engine and doing this isn't a big deal in the big scheme of things. I mean, it's kind of like you want it to be right when you're done, right? Not to have a half-tired or three-quarter tired engine underneath a new paint job. If I were in a different mindset not restoring the tractor, I probably would have just had the head done or maybe done nothing and just brought it on down the road, so to speak. The other two factors that come in is number one, how cheap rebuild kits for this engine are. I looked online and the lower half rebuild kit, you know, new sleeves, new pistons, rings, bearings, piston pins, $450 for the engine. That's, that's cheap. Uh, so that enters into the equation. And the second thing that enters into the equation is I'm doing this on YouTube. So this engine is a real common engine. The 113 variant was in the A's and B's and C's. The 123 was used in the Super C's. Both of these engines were also used in things like balers and combines back in the day. There's thousands and thousands of them around. Lots of people wanting to do them. Doing a complete rebuild on this engine is instructional for a lot of people. So that makes it more worth my time to pull the engine and go through it completely for anybody in the future that wants to do one of these. In addition, this, this engine survived all the way up to the 153 variant that's in my Firemall 504. The sleeveless, bored out version is pretty much the same engine. So this is such a common engine, it's worth doing a complete rebuild on YouTube, step by step, for folks to learn from. That means the next thing to do, and it's easier to pull the rest of the pistons and things after I get the engine out when I can put it on a stand, flip it over, Pull the front end off the engine, which just bolts on right here with four bolts. Take that off. Put the splitting stands on the bell housing. Take the engine off. Put it on 
uh, the engine stand, strip the engine down, take the crankshaft out, take the head to Mr. Richards and have him go through it. Find a shop to grind the crankshaft 10 under. I think I can do that. Don't need to take the block to the crank to the shop because these are wet sleeves. I can pull these sleeves myself, clean out the cooling jacket, and set the new sleeves in and new O-rings at the bottoms of the sleeves. And then this is the part where you just get what we used to call in architecture scope creep. Originally my plan was just to strip down the main chassis here, clean it paint it, start painting parts, putting them back on because I've been through various pieces of that. But once you get the engine off, you're saying, well, I better look at the clutch, you know, I better uh, look at the transmission seals. And then, you know, it just grows and grows into a lot more of a project than I had planned on doing. But that's the way it goes. When you do something, you do it right. So I guess that's the plan. Much, much different than I planned on last week or even yesterday. The reason I opened up this tractor so soon is I wanted to get what I needed to have done at the machine shop in line early because machine shops get busier with this kind of restoration work in the winter time and I think that Mr. Richards may go south for the winter so I plan on getting ahead to him in the next few days, getting the engine apart to pull the crank, getting the crank out to the machine shop hopefully sometime this week, and that's gonna sit while, well, because well, I'm busy with stuff outside and while the machine shops do their work, and then when the weather turns, we can really get going on this. That's the plan. Anyway, thanks for hanging with me for kind of a longish video, but as I said in the very beginning, it's episode one of what's sure to be many episodes. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time.